We are finally ready to start our last chapter. We're almost done. Okay, this chapter is a cool chapter. This one's about sound. Sound is a wonderful thing. It's how we function in most aspects of our life, but it has a lot more function than just communicating with each other. Let me show you one example. Here's an excellent picture of sound in use. This is twins. Two little babies still inside their mother's womb. And you can see them very clearly. There's the head of one, there's a foot of the other. This, this one's right side up. There's his head and his hands. And there's her head and her hands and her legs. This is such a cool picture. <clears throat> How did they get this picture? In the old days, before we had these tools, they had no idea if you were going to have a boy or a girl or twins or triplets. They had no idea. You just, they had to wait till it happened. Now we can figure it out. How do we do it? We have to know about sound. So let's talk about what sound is. Now, I've got a tuning fork here, and I'm going to hit it um, on, this, on this pen here. So when I hit this, what that's going to cause is these little tongs to vibrate back and forth. So as, as this tongue bou vi bounces back and forth, so does this tongue. They both bounce back and forth simultaneously. Now as this, as this tongue goes this way, it squeezes the air beside it. And then as it bounces back, it expands the air beside it. And so as we're bouncing it back and forth, it's squeezing and then expanding. Squeezing and then expanding. Only it's doing it very quickly. So quickly that you can't even see it. You can kind of see it if you looked up really close, and we're not going to do it with the camera. But if you look up real close, you can see it vibrating. And that vibration is how quickly it's squeezing and expanding, squeezing and expanding over and over and over. Now, what's neat about that is that as it does that, that sound doesn't just go in a line from this one that way. Sound is a sphere. It's like a bubble. And as it leaves here, it doesn't go this way, but it also goes this way, and this way, and that way, and this way. It goes exactly in all directions, evenly, and makes a bubble that travels out at the speed of sound. And so that bubble of this compressed air travels out in all directions. So if I hit this here, not only can I hear it here, but you could hear it there. And I'll put it up against the board so you can hear it. But it gets better than that, because not only is this one vibrating, but this one is also vibrating. So these waves can be added up if you stand in certain spots. We'll talk about interference later. But for now, let me give you an example. So I'm going to hit this on the table, get it going pretty good. And then you'll hear, once I put it on the board, you can hear it. <coughs> so that's what a sound wave is. It's a longitudinal wave. Remember, it's a compressional wave that we talked about last time. And it travels in a spherical nature. So no matter where you are from the speaker, you'll be able to hear it. Okay, so sound is a longitudinal wave, which means a compression, compressed area, and then a stretched out area that is called a rarefaction. And so it's spread out, smashed together, spread out, smashed together. And in the middle, in between the spread out and smashed areas, is a, is a normal area. And so we can plot this on a scale of how compressed or stretched out it is and plot it out when we get that nice sine curve that we talked about last chapter. Okay, so this is what sound is. How does it work in ultrasounds? In an ultrasound, this is the way it works. You get this little fancy device up here and uh, this, is, this is it. This is the whole thing. Um, and what it does is it just makes sound. It's got a little tuning fork in there that's vibrated by a computer and they put some jelly on the mother's womb here and uh, they put that in the jelly so that the sound never goes through air. Because if it went through the air, then it would hit the belly and bounce off the belly. But we don't want it to bounce off the belly. We want it to go into the belly. So there's jelly that's about the same density as her skin. So it goes through the jelly, through her skin, into her uterus, which is housing the child. And so as the sound goes into the, into the skin, through the jelly, through the skin, into the uterus, and then through the embryonic fluid, and at no point does it bounce back. It's all been the same density, same density, same density, density, and then it hits the child. 
and the child will be different than the embryonic fluid. So it's going to hit the child and bounce back. And then as that sound wave hits the child and bounces back, the computer was timing it. How much time did it take to go from here to the child and back? And if it knows how much time it took, then it can know how far away that child is. Well, that's just one spot on the child. How do they get a picture of the child? Well, if you move this over a little bit, then you can know how, how far apart this part of the child is. And then how far away is this part of the child? Now you see that this part is further away than this part. And you can get a, a picture of the child as you measure how far away the child is at different spots. And so you can end up getting an excellent picture like this, where you can see very clearly the eyes, the nose, the hands, you can count the fingers on them. Beautiful pictures, clearly showing that these are beautiful children inside of the mother's womb. Now, how fast does the sound travel? Inside of a fluid, the equation that describes how fast it travels is this equation here. Now you might be asking, what do all these things mean? First of all, as a V, it means speed, how fast, velocity. Okay, that's the same V we've been using all semester. This thing, beta, what is that? This is the Greek letter beta, is equivalent to our B. <clears throat> this beta refers to how easily the fluid is compressed. This is the compressibility of the fluid. And this thing here, this is that Greek letter rho that stands for density, just like we talked about when we were talking about density. So um, the speed of sound in a fluid is the compressibility divided by the density take square root. So we have a nice equation for that. For solids, guess what? You might think it's the same thing, and indeed it is, except we don't talk about solids in terms of compressibility. We usually talk about them in terms of how much they stretch or compress, and this is the Young's modulus that we talked about just a couple chapters ago. So this is the same equation. The Young's modulus describes how easily the metal is compressed or expanded divided by the density take square root. In air, the equation would be the same thing. It's just that the compressibility of air depends on the temperature, as does the density of air. Both of these depend on temperature, and so what they've done is they've made the equation a little bit easier for us, and they've worked it out so that all you need to know is the temperature, and that'll figure out both the compressibility and the density in one thing, in one fell swoop, so one variable determines the speed, determines the speed of sound in air. So you're going to use this equation quite a bit. Okay? Now, you might ask, well, okay, this is great. These are these nice equations. When am I ever going to use these? For most problems, you're just going to have to grab this speed of sound right off this chart. It's right in your book. Um, it's also on these slides that, you, that I'm posting on my website for you. So you can grab these slides, and you can see, just look up the speed of sound and these gases, you have to know the temperature at which you're using. For the most of them, the liquids, they're all going to use room temperature, and the solids, they're not as, depend as dependent on temperature. So you can generally just kind of look them up and, and get the answer. But if you're talking about air, you need to know the temperature. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's do our first problem. Here's the question. You're standing there, you see lightning off in the distance. Lightning comes down, strikes the ground, and then a few seconds later, you hear the thunder. It goes, and the question is, how far away is the thunderstorm? So we're given the time, the time that it took from you seeing it to you hearing it. You're given a time, and you're given a temperature, and you're asked, how far away? Okay, so let's draw it. write down what we know and what we need to know. We know the time that we measured was 6.4 seconds. The temperature is 32 degrees Celsius. Now, given the temperature, you can calculate the speed of sound in air, which is what this thunder is traveling through. That sound of thunder is traveling through air. So we can calculate that speed. That speed is going to be 331 times the square root of the temperature divided by 273. 
Now, the reason I left temperature blank up here is because you're going to feel like you can just plug in 32. You can, almost. Except that you have to first convert this to Kelvin. And so, when we're dealing with temperatures and heat and thermodynamics, that's next semester, but I'm going to give you this one equation, and you should know this one already because you probably had physical sciences way back in the ninth grade. And the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273. So we just need to take this 32, add 273 to it, and then you can plug it in up there. So when you add 32 plus 273, that's going to be 305. So now we know the speed of sound on this particular day. The speed of sound this particular day is 349.86 meters per second. So that's cooking pretty fast. Now, let's draw a picture and see what we can do with this problem. So the first thing we know is we've got to draw a cloud. There's our cumulus cloud, and down here is the ground somewhere, and way over here, there's you. Okay? So meanwhile, this lightning comes down, and it comes to you at the speed of light. So now, this lightning came to you at the speed of light. Did it happen immediately? No. It took a certain amount of time. Was it a lot of time? No, but let's not throw it away just yet. We, gotta, we need to know how much time did it take for the lightning to get to your ears, okay? Now, the next thing that happened was because this lightning was air molecules becoming ionized and turning into a plasma, that's why you saw it, it was this bright plasma, this ionized air, because of the electric, the electric potential difference that we'll talk about next semester, this ionized air got really hot and really energetic and it expanded really rapidly. And guess what expansion is? Expansion, and then it turned off and got cold, and so it shrunk back again. Sounds like a tuning fork, doesn't it? Expansion, compression. Expansion, compression. Oh yeah, that's what thunder is. This thing got loud, I mean compressed, and then smashed. And so it sent out a sound wave because it was hot. Okay, and so then you heard that, and I'll use a red marker for that. So out of the same place, a different thing traveled to you. As a result of the fact that there was lightning there, the expansion caused the thunder. And so now we took, it took time for the sound to travel that same distance. So now you have to be careful, because you have to think about this. They both traveled the same distance. They both started at the same time, because they were both caused by the same thing. What we can say is that the time that it took the sound to travel to your ears is equal to the time that you measured with the stopwatch plus the time that it took for the lightning to reach your ears. Let me say that again. The lightning left the thun left this spot, it happened here, and the, si the, the light from it traveled from here to your eyes. That took a certain amount of time, the time for the lightning. And then you started the stopwatch. 6.4 seconds later, that's the time you measured, and then you got the thunder. So the thunder is the result, or because it was the result of the lightning, the time for the thunder to reach your ears is equal to the time you measured plus the time of the lightning. This is kind of an abstract concept. You want to think about it for a minute before you just move on. Now, the thing you need to notice is that light and sound both travel at constant speeds. We don't have to deal with acceleration, so we only have to deal with the first of our fantastic four, and we can say that velocity is equal to distance over time. So now we can solve this equation for time. Time is equal to distance divided by velocity. Okay, so let's write all this out. The time for the sound is the distance from here to the lightning. That distance, that's the thing we're trying to find, divided by the speed of the sound. That's the time for the sound. This is equal to the time that we measured, which is 6.4 seconds, 
plus the time for the lightning, which is going to be the same equation, the distance divided by the speed of light. How fast is the speed of light? Well, the speed of light, that's something that we all know. You might remember from your physical science back in ninth grade, in case you don't remember it, the speed of light is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Okay? So look at that. Now we've got this nice little equation right here with only one unknown, a d. Problem is it shows up in two places. So at this point, the physics is done. We just need to solve this for d. So we've got a little bit of algebra left here. So I'm going to bring this up here, and we're going to solve this for d. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this thing over here, and I'm going to subtract it to the other side. So I get distance divided by the speed of sound minus distance divided by the speed of light equals 6.4. Now I'm going to pull a d out of this, so I get distance times 1 over speed of sound minus 1 over speed of light is equal to 6.4. Now I can just take this parentheses and divide it over there, so we get distance is equal to 6.4 divided by 1 over the speed of sound minus 1 over the speed of light, and there we go. So let's plug in some numbers. For this number, we're going to plug in our 349.86. For this number, we're going to plug in our 3.00 times 10 to the 8th. When you plug all that stuff in, what you're going to find is that this number here, this 1 divided by 3.008, which I'll again, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th becomes very, very small. And doesn't really affect this much. But you should calculate it anyway. Try it both ways and see what you get. And when you plug all this in, your answer is going to be 2,239.1 meters. Well, let's see. What is that in kilometers? That's 2.24 kilometers. What is that in miles? In miles, that's 1.39 miles. So there's our answer. If you hear, if you see thunder, and then start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. How far away is the storm? 1.39 miles. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my mom told me, just count the seconds between the lightning and the thunder, and that's how many miles away the storm is. So if what my mom told me was true, that storm would be 6.4 miles away. But it's not. It's 1.4 miles away. you got to step through the math. you got to do the physics. Old wives' tales don't give you the answers.